Again, you're watching our special edition here at I-24 News covering day 44 of Operation Protective Edge now uh, aimed at stopping the rocket fire, not just the rocket fire, but the hostilities from Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Now we're joined in the studio by Dr. Emily Landau, the director of the Arms Control and Regional Security Program at the Institute for National Security Studies, as well as uh, Moti Crystal, the former deputy head of the negotiation management at the Israeli Prime Minister's office, and Avi Malamed, an independent Middle East analyst. Thank you all for joining us here. Uh, as we continue to uh, try to understand what's taking place <laughs> around us here, uh, let's start with the negotiations here. Uh, it's been very relevant in the last week. Uh, in, a, in a way, it the, was. It in, was. In a way, the public uh, within yeah. Israel and very likely within the Palestinian society was holding their breath to see what would take place or what may succeed or come out of these negotiations here. Now, what did you perceive from the breakdown or failure of these talks? What took place in your perspective? The uh, I think that the, that the uh, professional terminology is. Uh, ZOPA, uh, no zone of possible agreement. Everyone who ever took negotiation class uh, recognizes this uh, this term. It seems that the uh, maximum that Hamas is willing to give uh, doesn't meet the minimum Israel uh, requirements are. From reports, uh, from the you know the accumulation of the reports coming on from from the talks uh, uh, themselves, it seems that. Uh, a good proposal, relatively good proposal, was on the table, and Hamas refused it because they understood that actually they get Abu Mazen and some sort of a start of a regime change from the back door, from the from the crossing point uh, uh, door. This is something that they could not, even in their m most uh, uh, dynamic narrative or storytelling, they could not understand to their constituency, to themselves, how come they won the war and we find uh, Abu Mazen's people on the uh, crossing border. When they saw that, plus the Qatari-Egyptian tension that I'm, I'm sure that Avi will, will refer to it, but according to some reports, uh, the Qatari government uh, threatened Mashal that if he will accept, uh, we'll the, 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 uh, the, he will be expelled. I think that these two forces uh, really brought this these round of negotiation to, uh, to a dead end. Well, we'll come back to this topic. Uh, right now we have to go to our correspondent, Eli Ochenberg, who's standing by on the Gaza border now with Israel. Uh, Eli, I understand there's been some activity there uh, just a short while ago. Uh, can you tell us what happened? Yes, David, only a couple of minutes ago, we've seen two rockets being launched from the Gaza Strip right behind me, uh, and uh, they uh, went up to the sky uh, as usual, but we didn't hear the red siren alert, uh, uh, in, in, not in southern Israel or in other places, so at the moment it remains a mystery. I hope we will, able, we will be able to update you regarding this uh, uh, launch uh, uh, in, uh, during our edition, but uh, this uh, launch comes after a very intensive day of rocket fire from the Gaza Strip towards different areas in Israel. We're talking about over 180 rockets being launched uh, towards southern and central Israel. It uh, was a very intensive day. And of course, the IDF activity, the aerial activity uh, in the Gaza Strip continues as well. There are still a lot of targets uh, for the IDF to attack from the, uh, from the air. So there's still a lot of work to be done. And at the moment, it doesn't seem that the situation is getting uh, more relaxed uh, the other way around. It seems the, like it's intensifying and uh, again a very, very uh, uh, intensive day of fighting from both sides and uh, uh, we'll of course keep you posted with any development uh, from here. Uh, Eli Ochenberg, our correspondent standing by on the border there. Thanks for the update here about the most recent activity now coming out of the Gaza Strip. Uh, we were talking about the negotiations here and some of the main points on the table here now. Disarmament of Hamas has been one of the main the uh, main points being advocated by the Israeli government here, reasonably, uh, after what we've seen, uh, what the government of, in Israel has uh, somewhat been surprised by, uh, the, the military capabilities have been discovered in the Gaza Strip with so many people living in poverty and in true despair, to see the type of investment that's gone into the military infrastructure here uh, in the Gaza Strip. How realistic, though, do you see that as being on the table in these, in these negotiations? Is, is that a realistic prospect at all right now? Well, first we have to see... What 
whether we still have negotiation or what kind of uh, negotiation might develop down the line um, and, and how instrumental Egypt will continue to be. Um, it should remain instrumental. Whether the United States will uh, join in and, and give some backing to the negotiations, uh, other regional international actors. Um, there was an equation that was raised already, I think, in the first or second weeks of Operation uh, Protective Edge, which is uh, basically reconstruction for uh, demilitarization of Hamas. And I think that equation is still somewhere on the agenda. Um, I think the problem is, though, that the reconstruction side of the equation is something that everybody can sort of agree to. I think uh, the Israeli government realizes that reconstruction of Gaza, of Gaza is in Israel's interest as well. And therefore you have a shared interest if we think in terms of uh, uh, Moti's uh, negotiations equations. Um, there there's a shared interest and there there's real possibility for moving forward. On the demilitarization... And, tangi and tangible, and tangible measures. And tangible, yes. And, and clear goals exactly. that uh, can be reached. On the demilitarization side, we don't have that. Um, total rejection on the part of Hamas, total interest, obviously, on the part of Israel, and some kind of lukewarm, I would say, interest on the part of other international actors who for, agree with Israel, Hamas, but aren't going to be willing to push on, for it. On fighting Israel, uh, how could anyone rationally come to the table demanding that they demilitarize? Do you see a scenario there that if they continue to exist, that they could even ex accept such a, well, such a factor? It, it, from Hamas's point of view, obviously not. But we have to remember, demilitarization has been on the table as far as Israeli-Palestinian negotiations for a long time. This isn't a new concept. And with regard to Hamas, I don't think that Israel can really accept um, the reconstruction element of the equation without the demilitarization, just because we saw in such stark uh, terms how Hamas took all of the aid that was supposed to go to building up Gaza and put it into the tunnels and, and their rocket capability. That needs to stop. The question is how you get that into a broader deal. How do you get broader support for that? Because at the end of the day, if there's any deal here, it's going to have to come with a lot of pressure, with political pressure. Um, Egypt's willing to press Hamas, but obviously that hasn't been enough. And we need these other international actors to get into the game and to pressure Hamas. Hamas needs to get the message that if they don't comply with certain elements of this deal, uh, they're going to be in real trouble. The question is who's going to give that message to Hamas? Well, that's my question here uh, for uh, Avi here. Uh, who should be more involved than what we're seeing today? We know the Qataris now have suddenly shown their leverage on the situation. Uh, the Egyptians were not the fair and honest broker here, but have definitely been making the effort since the beginning of this conflict. You have Turkey, who's tried to get involved, but been uh, pushed back by the Israeli side. Uh, do you see a player here that either should be more involved or is, is too involved perhaps in these in these negotiations? I think it's very important to understand that this whole military round between Israel and Hamas is actually a microcosmos to a larger struggle that is now taking place in the Middle East. Roughly speaking, what we see today is on the one hand an axis of uh, entities in the region, Arab entities, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, other Gulf states, putting Qatar aside for a moment, Jordan, and Israel. These are entities that understand that today in this rumbling Middle East and everything, this massive magnitude earthquake, they need stability above any other thing. This is a very interesting conjunction of interest of these entities. On the other hand, you have entities or semi-entities, entities like Qatar or Turkey, who try vis-a-vis -vis supporting the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, or Hamas, or whoever is relevant that time, to enhance instability because it serves their interest. Okay? So we also have today Hamas allying with other organizations in the region that are basically trying to enhance their radical ideology, looking for the sponsors from time to time. Uh, obviously, we have to remember as well the Iranian regime is involved in this whole, this, in whole this story. As of the context of putting pressure in, in, in the specific context of Hamas, obviously Saudi Arabia has a major role. By the way, the, the, the Qatari ruler was in Saudi Arabia a couple of days ago. Some people were translating it as a kind of like uh, going to Canossa, meaning he went to see the Saudi king and basically he was dictated by the Saudi king what should be the next move. 
apparently the Qatari ruler is trying to continue with its independence policy. Um, in addition to that, we have also to take into consideration the role of the international community. In that context, I think something that was very interesting coming up in the last couple of days was the name of this UN Security Council was mentioned, and it's quite obvious that it was mentioned following the model that was set following the 2006 war with the Hezbollah in Lebanon. I don't know how practical that model is as of the time being, but the fact that it was there, it's very important. And one last thing in that context, we have to remember that the whole issue of the disarmament of Hamas and other Palestinian factions in the Gaza Strip was first mentioned in a declaration signed by the whole 28 foreign ministers of the EU in the quite early stage of this whole round, even before the Prime Minister Netanyahu was talking about it, even which is very the interesting. negotiations in, in Cairo. The, the, uh, the interesting thing that uh, what, what uh, Avi and uh, Emily mentioned is that we will see now a different setup in the next negotiation rounds. It's not that Egypt failed, it is that Egypt didn't have enough leverage to bring Hamas to the table. I think that with the, EU, uh, with the EU support, with the European countries, and they will bring to some extent Turkey and Qatar, because it will not end without some sort of Qatarian uh, involvement here. And uh, US uh, complex relations with Turkey, we might see a regional setup very soon. I hope, as Emily mentioned, that Egypt will play a pivotal role because this is the axis in, in Avi's axis. This is the, the, the party or the entity, Avi mentioned, that Israel should help build back her position in the region. So the deliveries of Israel, because Netanyahu will not deliver or will not give any gift to Abu Mazen, but the gift should be provided to Assisi and strengthen this access. So I believe that very shortly we will see some region, some international setup. I don't know if it will be a conference or negotiation rounds. Just one point from a negotiation perspective, I hope Kerry will just come to sign the documents at the end, <laughs> rather than try to, because this, you it's know. Certainly a rational uh, approach there. Yeah. I, I also, I want to add, I mean, with regard to Turkey, maybe Qatar can, can join Lever. this yeah, uh, yeah. group in some way, but remember, there's real Qatari-Egyptian oh, tension definitely. there, and I don't know how willing they're going to, you know, uh, how willing they will be to let Egypt really run the show, and they're going to want to firm it, it, it sounds more and more like this entire situation has more to do with the region and all these there's international a lot players about than the, the Palestinian it, There's definitely that. But as far as Turkey is concerned, I mean, with Erdogan taking the positions that he's taken over these, uh, how many are we now, six weeks of, of this uh, Gazan war, I, I really don't think he should be granted a seat at the table. I mean, this was the, the at of the course. at the heart of the mistake that Kerry made, and of he course. made a mistake. You know, you go to Paris and and you're there with the Turkish foreign minister and with the Qataris. The Egyptians aren't there. There's no Israeli, but especially Turkey. This guy is spewing anti-Semitic rants from every you know platform and this is something that needs to be rejected i can't see how the international community can fathom letting uh, turkey have a, a legitimate seat at this table turkey's a member of nato the behavior of erdogan towards uh, you know other sovereign states in this Being region somewhat ignored by uh, is, many international uh, players is just uh, it was uh, another interesting information about the role or the negative role of turkey Turkey paid directly to the as a dinner Kassam Brigade some 60 million euros as part of 250 million dollars support that Turkey provided. There was a delegation of Hamas visiting uh, Turkey in late 2012, given Hamas major crisis, and they were looking desperately for money. They went there, uh, one committed the money, he provided them with the money, and um, here is something that I think is very interesting. A source the and, corruption, man. An Arab was source, speaking with his phone on the An line. Arab source that I really regard his, as a quite reliable one says that the headquarter of the operation of the kidnapping of the three Israeli settlers, the teenagers, is located in Turkey, 
Salah al is in Turkey, and the amazing thing, which is a piece of information, I can disclose it now, but I think it's no longer. There is some kind of like information saying that the kilos of the two of the three kids are, are now in, in Turkey. Are in Turkey. They've escaped to Turkey. Uh, we'll come back to this uh, interesting discussion here. Uh, first, what or who exactly caused the Gaza ceasefire to collapse so dramatically? Well, I-24 News correspondent Ayman Siksek focuses on one of the most likely answers. Is Qatar responsible for the collapse of the ceasefire between the State of Israel and Hamas? A senior Fatah official said Wednesday that Qatari government threatened to expel Hamas chief Khaled Mash'al, who is currently based in the country, if he agreed to the Egyptian ceasefire proposal. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas, who is currently in Jordan, is scheduled to meet with Mash'al in Qatar on Thursday. Mash'al reiterated the strategic importance of the truce following the renewal of the conflict. The aim is to realize the Palestinian demands and a truce is one of the ways or tactics to ensure successful negotiations or to facilitate the delivery of humanitarian aid to Gaza. Israel holds Mash'al responsible for disrupting a long-term truce settlement with Hamas by making demands that Jerusalem is unwilling to meet. Most notably, Hamas had reportedly insisted that Qatar join the negotiation talks in Cairo. But Egypt refused the request as it still resents the Qatari government's change of policies towards it since Abdel Fattah al-Sisi was brought to power. Al-Sisi met earlier this month with King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia to discuss key security issues impacting the region. But while the internal intrigue between the participants in the negotiation continues, the battle for the safety of Israel's citizens is expanding, with the fire targeting not only those on the Gaza border, but also Israelis in Tel Aviv and the capital city of Jerusalem. Again, speaking about the negotiations that have taken place, uh, we're talking about negotiations essentially between Israel and Hamas. Uh, certainly not equal parties coming to the table here now in terms of uh, the standing of, of both of them, yet uh, they're being brought together uh, in indirect negotiations here, uh, somewhat as if equals. Are you, have you been surprised by how this has been run uh, in terms of uh, Hamas is standing at the table here and everything else that's taken place? No, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not surprised at all. I even dare to say that I'm a big admirer of uh, Hamas negotiation capabilities. They come to the table knowing exactly what they want. They come to the table and building all the time the coalitions. At the beginning, it is a blocking coalition uh, that definitely forced Kerry to, to consider them as a serious like Turkey and Qatar. And slowly, slowly, they know how to build a supporting coalition. I uh, remember this is the Hamas that we negotiated, Israel negotiated with them the uh, agreement post uh, Kastled and uh, all the military operations and Gilad Shalit. They managed to get a very good deal in the Gilad Shalit negotiations. Um, the major negotiation challenge when you negotiate with Hamas is that you don't know how and who takes decision there. And they can always use what we call the negotiation vocabulary the board didn't approve tactic. So the negotiator, Musa Abu Marzouk in Egypt said, well, no problem, no problem. But suddenly Khaled Mash'al uh, didn't approve. So Abu Mazen finds himself in Qatar negotiating with uh, Ms. Khaled Mash'al. In the meantime, they making e Egypt uh, way. They know how to play the negotiation table very wisely. A question that is usually asked is who has more power in the negotiation, whether Israel or Hamas? Unfortunately, Unfortunately, I would say, unfortunately, Hamas across the negotiation table has more bargaining power. A, because they know their their political goals are very clear since the beginning of the uh, of of this uh, round. Open the siege, open the siege, or lift the blockade. One. 
second this uh, structure that makes them uh, using these tactics and third they have a better alternative because they have no problem making their people suffer and when someone come to the table with they don't care the cost of no deal for Israel, Israel economy, Israeli citizens, uh, Netanyahu prays today the strength of the Israeli uh, Israelis and, and the unity but Hamas we know how they use the, their population they know that they prays for death. Negotiating with a party that really prays the death is a challenge. I've asked a question, uh, this question to many people so far, but I have to put it to you. Israel coming out right away in this conflict with the quiet for quiet offer scenario. In other words, laying the cards on the table that ultimately uh, a return to quiet is what the government really seeks. Did that weaken the Israeli position here? Very much. I mean, this, this was a very, very poor political uh, agenda. And uh, there, was, there was a point, that there were three, four days that Israel, uh, public Israel, official public Israel, had at least six or seven different proposals, different different uh, equations. It was uh, uh, what Emily mentioned, disarmament for reconstructions and then quiet for quiet and then uh, crossing points for Oh, that's that's not the way you negotiate. Uh, Avi, now Egypt. Um, excuse me. Uh, don't come come to you in just a moment here. But Egypt now, uh, who's been sitting at the center of this negotiating table? How strong is this new government? They're uh, seems they're trying to insert themselves back into the equation as as a strong broker in the region. But in reality, where do they sit in the Middle East now? Let me tell you something. Sisi was a couple of days ago in Saudi Arabia. In the midst of all his turbulence, he went to Saudi Arabia. He was smiling, sitting with the king. As far as Sisi is concerned, that could go on for. The next couple of months for a couple of reasons. First, Hamas is beaten down to the ground. Sisi is shed no tears. Second, this whole uh, turbulence basically brings Egypt back to the center of the stage and basically reposition Egypt as a regional leader, strengthening Egypt in the context of the Egyptian US relationship. We have to remember the sensitive relationship between the current administration and the Egyptian government. It brings Egypt back to the center. And let us all remember one simple fact. In the end of the day, it is Egypt, not Qatar, not Turkey, not the United States that holds the keys to the passage. That shares the border yeah. uh, with the Gaza Strip. And as far as the Egyptians are concerned, that is fine. Um, and um, as of now, currently, and actually from day one, Al Sisi and Egypt are the biggest winner. And then another important thing in the context of the inner Egyptian arena, Sisi is monetizing this card because he's saying to his own people, look how irresponsible is not Hamas only, but its master, the Muslim Brotherhood. Because we have to remember that Egypt is now, Sisi is now engaged in an inner war in Egypt, fighting the Muslim Brotherhood. It plays well to the hands of Sisi at this point. You believe the sentiment on the Egyptian street, the people of Egypt, uh, agree with Sisi's position here now? Or do they... Do they share sensitivities for the suffering of the Palestinians that may, in the end, trump Sisi's position here, or is he strong enough to maintain his, his current role? The message that comes across the Arab world is very clear. They are showing sentiments in identification and solidarity with the Palestinians of Gaza. They loathe, hate, despise Hamas. But they're talking about the people. Now, when you look today, we are 45 days into this operation with terrible pictures coming out on Al Jazeera, with all the propaganda and whatever is going on. Hamas failed to basically boil the Arab world. You didn't see that. And mostly you didn't see that in Egypt. Not only you didn't see that in Egypt, when you see the Egyptian media, they are basically competing who will be the one who will be more viciously condemning Hamas for its misbehavior. Emily, is that the game now? The, who, can, who can in the end be the power broker in the situation? Is that the well, competition? Well, of course. That's been the competition all along for these parties. I wanted to make one comment on what Moti said when he was explaining the negotiations dynamic and how Hamas actually has greater bargaining power than Israel, even though you would seem it would seem to be the opposite, it's exactly the same with the Iranian nuclear negotiations, exactly the same. You would think that the P5 plus 1 have all the power in this negotiation, political, military, economic power. Who are the, you know, who is Iran facing this group of uh, powerhouses? But for those reasons, because Iran has clear political aims and, and, and their tactics of negotiation, they actually have the upper hand. So as Moti was uh, explaining that 
that dynamic, I was saying you could just switch, just switch you know, the name. Message, yeah. As far as uh, uh, what Avi uh, just said about Egypt, aside from the fact that Egypt has time and we would like Egypt to feel pressure here to get a deal, or Israel would like uh, Egypt to feel pressure, the other things that you said about Egypt I think are, are actually good news uh, for Israel looking to the longer term. In other words, enabling Egypt to reassert itself in its traditional leadership role in the Middle East. Uh, Egypt seeing Israel accepted in that role through this mediation. I think this is good news for Israel and for regional dynamics. And I'm thinking of some other you know, regional dynamics that are also sort of on the way back burner right now. For example, ideas to create a weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East that Egypt has been leading and making life very difficult for Israel in that regard. Maybe if, you know, with the CC government, if this could change that dynamic a little and Egypt would see that Israel is accepting it in that role, this could perhaps be translated into better news for some of these other regional dynamics. Uh, uh, Monty, despite ending the hostilities here now, is one of Israel's great interests to strengthen the relationship with Egypt now through this negotiation process? Or, or has Israel made some error already dealing with Egypt in this way? So far, no. <laughs> the, uh, there was uh, uh, some news uh, 24 hours ago that uh, Kerry, Israel, surrendered their uh, the request of uh, disarmament because of Kerry. There was some news uh, bits on that, and I was like, whoops, are we doing this mistake? I don't think. There are too many uh, people in the Israeli, in the close circles of Netanyahu, who are very aware of the importance and the emergence. I don't know at what point Israel will move actively actively to pursue Egypt's agendas and interests definitely vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., as, uh, as Avi mentioned. The, the key question now is, going back to what Netanyahu said just an hour ago, he introduced a new goal, finally, for this operation. In not only peace and quiet to the south, but also peace and quiet to the south, and new political horizon. So now all the investigators, all the researchers, all the reporters are looking for who is this new political horizon. And that was his last sentence. Yeah, that was his he last sentence. Elaborate. Well, I, I know the name of this political horizon. His name is Mohammed Abbas, Mahmoud Abbas. He, he's, but the, the issue here is that Netanyahu understands that if he wants to crash, defeat, you, you choose the terminology, defeat Hamas, he will need to do it politically by providing Abu Mazen the legitimacy of the savior of the Palestinian people. Can I just come in one point on that? I think in the Q&A that I saw in the makeup yeah. room uh, with Netanyahu, I think uh, he, when he was saying the new political horizon, he was actually alluding to the whole uh, Islamic State Religion. dynamic. Ah, in that, other that, words, the horizon. fact that no, yes. the fact that the United States, the Europeans are now seeing the terrible barbaric uh, things that the uh, Islamic State is doing, they have more understanding for what Israel is facing and this might bring them, you know, uh, to be better partners in whatever arrangement. Was, I think that's what he was alluding uh, yeah. to more yeah. than, but, <laughs> but I think he's already accepted the fact that Abbas is going to have right. a, but he a, needs a much to, he needs to, to, role. To, to give him something. To, to or tease to get it out something. a little bit. Avi, mean, what about the role of ISIS here? ISIS definitely making headlines daily right now with this Islamic State movement now. How are they affecting the entire region and in context of this conflict even? Enormously interesting. As the, as the Prime Minister himself connected to Netanyahu, Netanyahu is doing a very wise move, a very good PR move. He is putting Hamas together in the same basket with ISIS. Now the point is there are many differences between Hamas and ISIS. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because today in the average mindset of the average viewer in the West, when they look at the Middle East, what they see, a bunch of young Muslims with masks or without masks, massively armed, and they are either killing somebody else or threatening to kill somebody else. In the eyes of the average viewer in the West today, Hamas, ISIS, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, Jama'at Jihadiyah, Jama'at Salafiyah, they are all the same basket. Lost in the conversation, and this, is, this is a great PR move by Netanyahu. Hamas is enormously disturbed with it because Hamas was very much busy and engaged in the last couple of years in what we call showing a smiley face, a smiley face to the world, 
this puts Hamas in a major crisis. Do you think that they'll come out, that Hamas will come out and try to distance themselves from the Islamic State movement in any way now? Or? They are already trying all the First time. First of all, they will remove the masks. <laughs> for example, maybe, for example, they, are, they understand this is a major challenge because today in the battle of PR, Hamas is facing a massive crisis because once Benjamin Netanyahu, by the way, he started this also in the recent uh, speech that he was making, once he put them in the same basket with ISIS, Hamas is in a problem. So this, this complicates, complicates Hamas's I, th I think Rouhani just said, or somebody from Iran just said, that ISIS is the mercenary of Israel. That's oh, yeah, it's very a lot common. of accusations been thrown up. Thank you very much, so Avi Malamed, Emily Lando, yeah. and Monte Cristo. Thank you all for Thank being with much. us on our special yeah. edition here. Well, I'm David Matlin, coming to you from the Jaffa Port in Israel and wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us.